Hi, this is Dustin Pesselin with Hope Through Prophecy. This video you are about to watch will reveal Satan's battle plans, his end game for the final days. You will learn about the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, and the role of the United States in Bible prophecy. This video contains the most solemn truths ever entrusted to mortal minds. I ask that you pray before watching. And please share this video far and wide so that this truth can reach the world. May the Lord guide you and bless you on your journey. The Antichrist. This very word has been the source of fascination and intrigue for thousands of years. This mysterious being will be at the center of end-time Bible prophecy and will be responsible for the infamous Mark of the Beast. There's no need to guess about this diabolical power. In this video, we will go directly to the Bible to prove exactly who the Antichrist is. Stay tuned. Numerous theories have swarmed about who the Antichrist truly is. In this video, we will provide no speculation or rumors, but will now go right to the Bible to identify this Antichrist power. Speaking of the apocalyptic book of Revelation, the Bible says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. Blessed is he who reads, and those who hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. You will notice that the book of Revelation is from Jesus, and a blessing is pronounced on those who listen to and obey its words. While this message about the Antichrist is a solemn warning, it is also a message of love from Jesus. He wants us to know the truth so we can be protected and saved. Revelation 14 contains the three angels' messages, God's final warning to the world. The third angel specifically warns about the beast, another name for the Antichrist, and its mark. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark, shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. The greatest judgments in human history are prepared for those who worship this Antichrist beast and receive its mark. As you may know, the book of Revelation is full of symbolism. In order for us to identify the meaning of symbols, we must let the Bible interpret itself. So according to the Bible, what does a beast represent? The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth. The Bible reveals that a beast represents a kingdom in apocalyptic prophecy. Now brace yourself, friends. This mysterious beast or kingdom that will enforce the mark of the beast is vividly described in Revelation chapter 13. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. We will now consider this beast of Revelation 13 and 10 identifying characteristics that describe it in detail before we positively identify this Antichrist power. God provides multiple characteristics of the beast because he wants us to have no doubt about its identity. As we consider these 10 characteristics, begin to ask yourself who this power is. You students of history will most likely recognize it before it is revealed later in this video. 1. The Antichrist rises out of the sea. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. According to the Bible, a sea represents a heavily populated area. The waters which you saw are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So this beast power would arise from a heavily populated area. 2. The Antichrist receives its throne, power, and authority from the dragon. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. This beast would receive its power, authority, and even its capital city, or seat, from the dragon. Who or what is the dragon? We know from the Bible that the dragon represents Satan. However, the Bible is actually more specific about who this dragon is in verse 2. 
And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. And the dragon stood before the woman, who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. This passage refers to the birth of Christ and how Satan tried to destroy Christ at his birth. Which power did Satan work through to try and accomplish this? It was Rome. Herod, the king of the pagan Roman Empire, tried to destroy Jesus at his birth. So, according to Revelation, Rome would give this Antichrist beast its power, throne, and capital city. Some of you may be starting to see which historical power matches these descriptions. 3. The Antichrist becomes a global power. All the world marveled and followed the beast. An authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Clearly, this Antichrist would have global, worldwide power and influence. 4. The Antichrist is guilty of blasphemy. On his heads a blasphemous name, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. The Bible defines blasphemy in two ways, claiming the power to forgive sins and claiming to be God himself. This beast power would be guilty of both forms of blasphemy. Which organization could this be referring to? We will soon find out. 5. The Antichrist rules for 42 prophetic months. He was given authority to continue for 42 months. In Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals one literal year. We see this principle in Numbers 14.34 and also Ezekiel 4.6 which says, I have appointed thee each day for a year. So this Antichrist power would rule for 42 prophetic months, which is 1260 days in the Hebrew calendar, which amounts to 1260 literal years. Interestingly, this 1260 year reign for the Antichrist is referenced seven times in the prophetic books of Daniel and Revelation. Six, the Antichrist receives a deadly wound that is later healed. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. The Bible speaks of this beast power receiving a deadly wound which would later be healed. We will shortly reveal how this very thing happened to the Antichrist. 7. The Antichrist receives worship. They worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Clearly, this beast power is different from other nations as it receives worship. The Antichrist would be some sort of religious political power. 8. The Antichrist persecutes God's people. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. The Antichrist would be guilty of mass bloodshed against God's very own people. In just a moment, we will pull back the curtain on this blasphemous opponent of God and his saints. 9. The Antichrist has a man as its leader, for it is the number of a man. Revelation refers to a man who represents this Antichrist power. Daniel chapter 7 describes the little horn power, which is a parallel prophecy of the Antichrist. And there, in this horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. This beast power would have a single man who serves as its representative and leader. We will soon reveal who this is. Ten. The Antichrist has the number 666. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Notice that 666 is not the mark of the beast, but it is rather the number of a man. The mysterious number would identify the leader of the Antichrist power. So who is the Antichrist? Based on these 10 characteristics, some of you may have identified it already. 
there is only one organization in human history that matches all 10 of these characteristics with perfect accuracy. The Antichrist is none other than the Papacy, the Roman Catholic Church-State Union. Shortly, we will see how this institution perfectly fits each of these 10 characteristics. But let us be clear, friends, there are many sincere, loving Christians in the Catholic Church who are doing the best they know. This biblical Antichrist warning is not about the people in the Catholic Church, but it's about a false system which has set itself against God. Once again, God gives us this solemn warning for our blessing and safety. Make sure that you carefully watch each of the following 10 proofs to see how the papacy perfectly matches these biblical descriptions in a way that no other power can. But first, we must realize that this teaching of the Catholic Church-State Union being the Antichrist is nothing new. The majority of Christian churches today started out by believing and teaching this. In fact, the leaders of the Protestant Reformation taught this very truth. Consider the words of Martin Luther, the most well-known of the Reformers and the founder of the Lutheran Church. We here are of the conviction that the papacy is the seat of the true and real Antichrist. John Calvin, another prominent reformer and theologian, agreed with Luther on this issue. Some persons think us too severe and censorious when we call the Roman Pontiff Antichrist. I shall briefly show that Paul's words in 2 Thessalonians 2 are not capable of any other interpretation than that which applies them to the papacy. The famous Baptist pastor Charles Spurgeon, possibly the most renowned preacher and theologian in modern Christianity, proclaimed, It is the duty of every Christian to pray against Antichrist. And as to what Antichrist is no sane man ought to raise a question, if it is not the popery in the Church of Rome and in the Church of England, there is nothing in the world that can be called by that name. The word Protestant has at its root the word protest. The Reformation was a protest against the abuses and false teachings of the Catholic Church. Sadly, most Protestant churches today have forgotten what they are protesting against. It is no longer politically correct to teach this biblical truth about the Antichrist. But here on Hope Through Prophecy, we are committed to sharing the truth, no matter how uncomfortable it might be. We want you to avoid deception and be prepared for Jesus' soon return. We will now reveal the 10 proofs of the Antichrist. Proof 1. The papacy rose out of a well-populated area. The Bible prophesied that the Antichrist power would arise out of the sea which we learned represents peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. The papacy fulfills this point perfectly, as it arose in Western Europe, the center of world civilization at that time. Proof 2. The papacy received its throne, power, and authority from Rome. As we examine history, there is no doubt that pagan Rome transferred its power, throne, and even its capital city directly to Papal Rome, the Catholic Church State. The capital of the empire was transferred from Rome to Constantinople, allowing the papacy to be the chief power in Western Europe. History tells us the Roman Church pushed itself into the place of the Roman world empire, of which it is the actual continuation. The Pope, which calls himself King and Pontifex Maximus, is Caesar's successor. Clearly, the Catholic Church matches this second characteristic. Proof 3. The papacy is a global power. No one would argue that the Catholic Church now has worldwide influence. Leaders of the most powerful nations in the world flock to pay homage to the Pope. The power and influence the papacy had during the Middle Ages and has in the present day is undeniable. In fact, the very word Catholic means universal. There's no doubt that proof three matches the Catholic Church. Proof four, the papacy claims to be God on earth and to forgive sins. 
As we learned, the Bible defines blasphemy as claiming to be God and claiming the power to forgive sins. The papacy matches this fourth proof perfectly. Please brace yourself, friends, as we consider this startling quote taken directly from the Catholic Catechism. Does the priest truly forgive the sins, or does he only declare that they are remitted? The priest does really and truly forgive the sins in virtue of the power given to him by Christ. The entire Catholic confessional system is a man-made counterfeit to God's plan of salvation. Only God can forgive sins. Not only does the papacy claim to forgive sins, but they believe the Pope to be equal to God himself. In 1903, Pope Leo XIII states, But the supreme teacher in the church is the Roman pontiff. Union of minds, therefore, requires complete submission and obedience of will to the church and to the Roman pontiff as to God himself. Consider this shocking quote by the same Pope. We, the popes, hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Friends, these statements are nothing short of blasphemy. Proof 5. The papacy reigned for exactly 1260 years. We have seen that a day in Bible prophecy is equivalent to a year. It was prophesied that the Antichrist would reign for 42 prophetic months, equating to 1260 literal years. Let us see if this was the case. Papal Rome received full supremacy in Europe in 538 AD. On this date, there was no longer opposition to Emperor Justinian's decree giving the Pope control and power. The papacy enjoyed absolute power over the nations of Europe throughout the Dark Ages, when the people were kept in spiritual and intellectual darkness. Then, in the year 1798, the papacy received what came to be known as a deadly wound when the Pope was taken captive by the French General Berthier. This event marked the end of the papacy's dominance in Europe. How many years passed between 538 A.D. and 1798 A.D.? Let's do the math. Exactly 1260 years, a perfect fulfillment of prophecy. Yes, this is yet another specific proof that the papacy is the Antichrist, a title that no one else can claim. Proof 6. The papacy received a deadly wound which is now healed. Once again, the papacy received this deadly wound in 1798. Napoleon's general Berthier took the Pope captive, showing the vulnerability and weakness of the papacy, effectively ending their 1260-year reign. However, the Bible prophesied that this deadly wound would someday be healed. No one will argue the universal power, influence, and prestige the papacy now has. In fact, the ecumenical movement has the goal of uniting all Christian faiths together and putting an end to the protest that once helped define the Protestant faith. Notice these words from Bishop Tony Palmer, who was invited by the prominent televangelist Kenneth Copeland to speak in an ecumenical assembly of church leaders from across the country. The protest is over. The protest is over. Not only does Palmer claim that the protest against the papacy is over, but he boldly states the following. If there is no more protest, how can there be a Protestant church? Friends, a movement is underway to undermine the Protestant faith and reunite with Rome. The Pope himself spoke via video at the same event. Un uomo semplice del popolo dice questa frase. Non ho trovato mai che il Signore abbia incominciato un miracolo senza finirlo bene. Lui finirà bene questo miracolo di unità. As you can see, the Pope's appeal for unity is embraced by Kenneth Copeland and the room full of Protestant leaders. And since we know not how to pray for him as we ought other than to agree with him in his quest and in his his heart for the 
unity of the body of Christ. We come together in the unity of our faith, hallelujah. The Vatican is at the center of pushing for this one world religion, and Protestants are beginning to embrace it. But friend, don't fall for it. The Bible reveals that this unity will lead to widespread deception, and eventually, the mark of the beast. Unity is a good thing, but never at the expense of truth. This unity with Rome would have been unheard of by the Founding Fathers of America. Our nation was built on the principles of religious liberty, a nation without a king, and a church without a pope. But the Bible reveals that the deadly wound would be healed, and prophecy is being fulfilled before our very eyes. Proof 7. The Papacy Receives Worship A beast in Bible prophecy represents a nation. However, this beast of Revelation 13, the Antichrist, would be unique from others in that it would be both a nation and a religious power that receives worship. There's no doubt that the papacy matches this proof as well. We all know that the papacy is a religious power, but did you know that Vatican City, the headquarters of the papacy, is actually a nation? In fact, the Vatican is the world's smallest country taking up just 0.2 square miles inside of Rome, Italy. That's just 20% of the size of Central Park in New York City. Despite its minuscule size, the Vatican is one of the most powerful nations in the world and receives worship from across the globe with over 1 billion followers. Proof 8. The papacy has persecuted God's people. The Bible prophesied that this Antichrist power would shed the blood of God's people, the saints. The fact that the papacy matches this proof better than any organization in history simply cannot be denied. That the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. Historians estimate that over 50 million lives were destroyed by the papacy during the Dark Ages over matters of religion. To his credit, Pope John Paul II admitted to and apologized for these mass murders. But this cannot undo these horrible atrocities. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, boldly stated, referring to the papacy, he is, in an emphatical sense, the man of sin, as he increases all manner of sin above measure, and he is too properly styled the son of perdition, as he has caused the death of numberless multitudes, both of his opposers and followers. He it is that exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, claiming the highest power and the highest honor claiming the prerogatives which belong to God alone. Considering how heavily involved the papacy has been with God's people over the years, it would be shocking if they were not prophesied in the Bible. Proof 9. The papacy has a man as its leader. The Roman Catholic Church state fulfills Proof 9 as well. The Pope is widely known as the visible head of this worldwide power. Roger Williams, the founder of the First Baptist Church in America says this about the Pope, the pretended vicar of Christ on earth, who sits as God over the temple of God, exalting himself not only above all that is called God, but over the souls and consciences of all his vassals, yea, over the Spirit of Christ, over the Holy Spirit, yea, and God himself, speaking against the God of heaven, thinking to change times and laws, but he is the son of perdition. Proof 10. The papacy has the number 666. The number 666 has been the source of great fear and intrigue for many, but there need not be any doubt on the meaning of this number. Many have mistakenly believed it to be the mark of the beast, but the Bible says, Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. So 666 is the number of the beast and of a specific man in that organization. Who could this man be? 
Could it be the Pope, the recognized leader of the beast power? One of the names often given to the Pope is Vicarius Philae Die, which is Latin for Vicar of the Son of God, or Substitute for the Son of God. We have already seen that this is a position that the papacy claims. Notice what happens when you add up the Roman numeral values for his name. These numbers add up exactly to, you guessed it, 666, the number of the beast and the number of a man, just as the Bible prophesied. Friends, God wants us to have no doubts about the identity of this beast power. In this video, we have seen 10 distinct proofs, all perfectly fulfilled by the papacy. And this knowledge is essential because it will be this antichrist beast power who will inflict the infamous mark of the beast throughout all the world. Shortly, this video will reveal this mark. Do not miss it, friends. Your eternal life is at stake. Once again, this warning about the Antichrist is not an attack on our precious friends in the Catholic Church, but against Satan himself and a counterfeit system of worship that opposes itself against God. It is a message of warning and love from Jesus himself, who wants all of us including Catholics, to be saved in his kingdom. Now that we have identified this first beast of revelation, the Antichrist, we can now discover its mark, the final test for all mankind, the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast, the most urgent warning in all of human history, and it is given by God himself. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Many Christians are confused on what this mysterious mark is. This knowledge is essential because whoever receives the mark will be eternally destroyed. We will go straight to the Bible to reveal with 100% certainty the mark of the beast and how you can avoid it. Before we reveal the mark of the beast, we will first review the identity of the beast itself and also God's mark or seal for his people in the last days, of which the mark of the beast is a direct counterfeit. First, let us travel back to the courts of heaven, where this conflict between good and evil began. Lucifer was created perfect and was recognized as the wisest and most beautiful of all the created beings. In fact, he held the exalted position of being the covering cherub of God's throne in heaven. Within this throne is contained God's holy Ten Commandment law, the unchangeable transcript of his character, the eternal code of moral living for all the universe. Lucifer, like all of God's created beings, was given free will. Instead of using this free will to glorify and honor God, Lucifer chose to rebel and allowed his heart to be filled with pride. He coveted the very throne of God. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created, till iniquity was found in you. Lucifer became the first to commit iniquity or sin, which the Bible defines as breaking God's law. He broke the very Ten Commandment law that he had been assigned to cover and exalt in heaven. Refusing to return his allegiance to God, Lucifer was eventually cast out of heaven, along with those who rebelled with him, one third of the angels in heaven. Why didn't God destroy Lucifer right then and there? If he did, then the universe would obey God out of fear rather than love. There would still be doubts about God's character and his law. God is allowing sin to run its course so that each human being can see the results of sin and decide for themselves which master they will serve. Now the war between good and evil rages on, and this planet is the battleground. Lucifer, now known as Satan, roams this earth seeking to tempt human beings, the crown of God's creation, into rebelling against their creator and his holy law. The Bible warns us, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 
Satan, in the form of a serpent, tempted Adam and Eve, our first parents, into sin, bringing death, pain, and woe to this world. Jesus Christ, the hero of the human race, came to this earth to pay the death penalty for our sin, for the broken law of God. Jesus lived a perfect life and kept his Father's commandments. Yet he died for us that we might live. His sacrificial death on the cross proved two things about God. One, that God is righteous. His Ten Commandment law is eternal and can never be changed. Even Jesus had to pay the penalty for the broken law of God since he took our sins upon himself. Two, it proved that God is love. He sent his own son to die that we might live. Throughout history, Satan has worked through various nations and agencies to try to tempt, deceive, and destroy God's people, including ancient Egypt and the teaching of spiritualism that the soul lives on after death, and Babylon with its heathen practices and sorcery, and the brutal Roman Empire who tried to destroy Jesus as a child. And as we saw in a previous video, Satan would even infiltrate the church itself using the Roman Catholic Church-State Union to persecute and deceive God's people. But during every period of history, God has always had a people that stand for Him, even in the midst of the most ferocious attacks. This great controversy between Christ and Satan has raged on through the centuries and continues to this very day. Whether we realize it or not, each of us is engaged in a war a battle for our very soul. We must make a decision, a choice, as to which master we will serve, Christ or Satan. Throughout history, allegiance to God has always been evidenced by one thing, obedience. Now by this we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He who says, I know Him, and does not keep His commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. Our actions, our decisions, reveal to God and to the universe who we belong to. So the mark of the beast, the final test for mankind, will be an issue of worship, an issue of obedience. Who will we serve? Before we reveal this infamous mark, we must identify the beast itself also known as the Antichrist. There is only one power in human history that perfectly matches each biblical description of the beast, the Roman Catholic Church-State Union, the papacy. This is not an attack on the people within the Catholic Church, but rather a warning against a false system of worship. This is also not a new teaching, but was widely accepted as clear truth by the Protestant world. Numerous Christian reformers and preachers, such as Luther, Calvin, Wesley, Williams, Spurgeon, and more, have all firmly held this view. However, there is another characteristic of the Antichrist that we must discuss as we prepare to reveal the mark of the beast. In Daniel's description of the Antichrist, we read that it would think to change times and laws. Is it true that the papacy, the beast of Revelation 13, would attempt to change God's times and laws? Yes, it is. In their official catechisms, the Catholic Church has changed the Ten Commandments. They have removed the Second Commandment, which forbids the worship of idols, and they have split the Tenth Commandment into two, so that there are still ten in total. But what about the time mentioned in Daniel 7.25? Did the papacy attempt to change God's times in any way? Yes, they did. Once again, in their official catechisms, the Catholic Church has shortened the fourth commandment that discusses the Sabbath, the only commandment that deals with time, from 94 words to just eight. What's more, they have openly and blasphemously defied God and His law by claiming to change the Sabbath day from the seventh day, as the Bible commands, to the first day of the week, also known as Sunday. Please do not take my word for this, friend. In their official writings, the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, the papacy states, Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, 
Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church and the Council of Laodicea transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. The Catholic Church even boldly claims to have the power to change God's holy law. Had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. Does any man or organization truly have the power to change God's law? Absolutely not. The Bible says, You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. A false teaching has crept into the Christian church that says obedience to God's commandments is no longer required. Friends, this is a deadly deception that is not supported by the Bible. On the contrary, God tells us blessed are those who do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. And we have already seen that obedience to God's laws is the sign that we belong to Him. So it makes sense that the Antichrist beast would try to change God's law to deceive people into disobedience and separation from God. In fact, the seal of God has to do with allegiance and obedience to God's law. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. Before we reveal the mark of the beast, we will now identify the seal of God, which the mark of the beast is a direct counterfeit. If you ask any banker, the best way to discover a counterfeit is to first learn the truth. In ancient times, when a ruler sent out a decree, his authorized seal contained three elements, name, title, and territory. Official seals contain each of these three things. So, what about the seal of God? We have learned that it has to do with obedience to God's commandments. Do any of the commandments have all three elements of an official seal? Yes, there is one. Consider the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. This is God's name. In it thou shalt not do any work, for in six days the Lord made, this reveals God's title, the Creator, heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, this is God's territory, and rested the seventh day. So, we can see that the Sabbath is the only one of God's commandments that contains all three elements of an official seal, God's name, title, and territory. Speaking of God's Sabbath, the Bible reveals, Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths, to be a sign between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. And, hallow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. The Bible reveals that the word seal, mark, token, and sign can be used interchangeably. In the last days, the devil will have his mark, but the Sabbath is God's sign, or mark, of His faithful people who will be protected and receive eternal life. So, let's review what we have learned. 1. The mark of the beast will come from the beast power, which we have identified as the papacy. 2. The mark of the beast will be centered around worship, specifically obedience to God's commandments. Another reason we can be sure of this is because the verse directly after the mark of the beast warning in Revelation 14 declares, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Yes, in contrast to those who worship the beast and take his mark, are those that stay faithful to Jesus and obey his commandments. Three. The mark of the beast will be a substitute or counterfeit of the seal of God, which we have learned is the Sabbath. It is now time, friends, the moment we have been waiting for. What is the mark of the beast? Let us allow the beast power itself, the papacy, to answer this question for us. 
The church is above the Bible. In this transference of Sabbath observance from Saturday to Sunday is proof positive of that fact. Speaking of this change of the Sabbath, the papacy even openly admits this act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. Sunday sacredness is the mark of the beast. The alleged change of the Sabbath is the sign or mark of the beast's supposed power and authority. Now let's be clear, many sincere loving Christians worship on Sunday or believe it to be a holy day. We are not judging anyone's heart. God only holds us responsible for what we know or had the chance to know. But when God reveals truth to us, we are responsible to follow it and it will be for our blessing. It's also important to note that no one has the mark of the beast right now. We will learn when this will take place in just a moment. Friends, only one day in the week is sacred, and that is the seventh day Sabbath, which goes from sunset Friday to sunset on Saturday. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Notice that God blessed the seventh day, not a seventh day, and he specifically blessed the day in which he ended his creation of this world. Only God can make a day holy, and we have no right to choose another day. By substituting Sunday for Saturday, the papacy has created a direct counterfeit to the Sabbath, the seal of God. As prophesied in the Bible, they have sought to change times and law, and in so doing, claim to be above the Bible and even above God himself. But what does God say about teaching man-made beliefs instead of the Bible? And in vain they worship me, teaching his doctrines the commandments of men. So, how does one receive the mark of the beast, or the seal of God? Speaking of the beast of Revelation 13, the papacy, the Bible says, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. We know that the book of Revelation is full of symbols. So what does this mean to receive a mark in the forehead? This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Notice that God promises to write His laws on our minds, and it is the frontal lobe, or the forehead, where we make our moral decisions. The Bible reveals that the forehead is symbolic of our decisions. Speaking of God's seal, the Sabbath, the fourth commandment declares, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And where do we remember? With our mind or forehead. Accepting the seal of God involves making a decision to obey God's true Sabbath, worshiping Him as the Creator. In contrast, the mark of the beast can be received on either the forehead or the hand. What does this mean? Again, the forehead is where we make our moral decisions. It shall be as a sign to you on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. The mark will be received on the forehead when someone believes in a false Sabbath, Sunday, despite the biblical evidence that shows otherwise. They are deceived. What about the hand? The Bible reveals that the hand is a symbol of work or actions. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. The mark of the beast will be received on the hand by those who decide to follow the crowd and accept Sunday as holy in order to avoid persecution. This group is not deceived into believing a false Sabbath, but their actions will show submission to the authority of the beast. So, we can be certain that the mark of the beast is not a physical mark. Remember, the plan of salvation and the entire great controversy between good and evil has always been based on our free will, our decision to either accept or reject God and His requirements. 
and the greatest showdown between good and evil will be based on the same principle, the freedom of choice. To suggest otherwise is simply not biblical or even reasonable. Think about it. If the mark of the beast was a physical sign, such as a barcode, tattoo, or other such thing, then sincere Christians who have made the decision to follow God and even die for their faith could be drugged and given the mark of the beast while they are unconscious without even choosing to comply with it. Throughout the book of Revelation, the key issue in the battle between good and evil is worship and making a decision to either follow Christ or Satan. The mark of the beast will be based on our decision. When will people receive the mark of the beast? And then no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. This verse reveals that there will be an economic boycott on those who refuse the mark. So the mark will not be just a religious issue, but a political one as well. The government will require Sunday to be accepted as a holy day. Since the mark of the beast will not be a physical mark, how will the government be able to identify those who cannot buy or sell in the last days? The Bible doesn't reveal exactly how these laws will be enforced, but it could be that the bank accounts of those who refuse the mark will be frozen. Or it is possible that a microchip or some other device might be used to identify those who can buy and sell in the last days, but this device will not be the mark of the beast. We have already seen from the Bible that the mark is a symbol for our decisions or actions. The mark will be received when the civil authorities enforce acceptance of Sunday as a holy day. When people comply with these decrees, rather than the commandment of God to keep the Sabbath holy, they will then receive the mark of the beast. But could such a Sunday law really happen? The fact is, it already has. Currently on the official books of 28 U.S. states are what are known as blue laws. According to worldpopulationreview.com, blue laws are laws designed to restrict certain activities on Sundays or other specific days for religious reasons in order to observe a day of worship or rest. Blue laws also may ban shopping or ban sale of specific items on Sundays. In the 18th and 19th centuries, people were often arrested, fined, and sometimes even served jail time for conducting business on Sunday. It was believed that these citizens were actually breaking the Sabbath. As our culture has grown more secular over the years, many of these Sunday blue laws have been repealed, yet they still exist in various states. Sometimes it is the sale of alcohol that is prohibited on Sunday. These blue laws are often defended because they are seen to have both a secular and a religious benefit. So what is the problem with these Sunday laws? First of all, the Bible teaches that the seventh day of the week is holy, the Sabbath, and not the first day of the week, Sunday. Secondly, these Sunday laws are a dangerous combination of church and state. Throughout history, when religious matters have been legislated by the government, it has often led to mass bloodshed of God's people. God's government is based on freedom of choice and not force or pressure. That is why the United States of America was founded on the principles of civil and religious freedom, and the First Amendment protects our right to worship God as we choose. These Sunday laws not only violate our Constitution, but are a foretaste of what is to come according to Bible prophecy. When church and state unite to enforce Sunday worship, this will be an image to the beast and that it will be an image or reflection of the way the papacy, the beast, has used political power and violence to enforce their doctrines in the past. There will be a death decree against God's people who refuse to accept this mark of the beast, the false day of worship. The image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Even as we speak, the movement to keep Sunday holy is gaining prominence around the globe. In his latest encyclical, Laudato Si, on care for our common home, the Pope engages the world in a discussion on how we are treating our planet and what we can do to improve. 
Interestingly, the Pope uses this encyclical to promote a day of worship, not the Bible Sabbath, but the first day of the week, Sunday. The Pope states that Sunday is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. Students of the Bible will see this as one more step in the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Climate change, moral decline, or a financial collapse could all be used as an excuse to enforce Sunday worship. What's more, the leaders of Protestant churches, which were once strongly opposed to the false doctrines of the Catholic Church, are now extending their hands to unite with Rome. Consider the words of Bishop Tony Palmer, who is here speaking to a large crowd of evangelical, supposedly Protestant Christians. If there is no more protest, how can there be a Protestant church? The protest is over. The protest is over. The Pope also expressed his desire for unity via phone conference at the same event. Evangelical leader Kenneth Copeland, who invited Palmer to the event, goes on to agree with the Pope's quest for unity between Catholics and Protestants. And since we know not how to pray for him as we ought other than to agree with him in his quest and in, in his, his, his heart for the unity of the body of Christ. We come together in the unity of our faith, hallelujah. This ecumenical movement is simply a fulfillment of prophecy, which speaks of the world following after this antichrist beast power, the papacy, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. The Catholic Church-State Union, one of the most influential powers in the world, is at the center of this ecumenical movement, which will create a one-world religion in the last days. In order for the world churches to unite, there must be a compromise in doctrine, and Sunday worship, the mark of the papacy's authority, will be a foundational unifying factor. Unity is a good thing, but never at the expense of truth. In just a moment, we will discover the role of the USA in Bible prophecy as it relates to the mark of the beast. I realize that this Bible teaching may be new to some of you. I know it was for me as well. But friends, I appeal to you today, go by the Bible. Remember, if it's in the Bible, I want it. If it's not in the Bible, it's not for me. Some of you may be thinking, but my pastor does not teach this. Or he says that keeping the Sabbath is not important. What does the Bible say about these kind of pastors or teachers? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. Friends, the Bible condemns pastors who are willfully ignorant about God's law. Many church leaders will encourage their members to keep nine out of ten commandments, saying the Sabbath is no longer binding. But the Bible says, For whoever shall keep the whole law, and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. How does God feel about pastors who make no difference between common things and holy things such as the Sabbath? Her priest had violated my law and profaned my holy things, they have not distinguished between the holy and unholy, nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean, and they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths, so that I am profaned among them. Almost all Protestant churches have openly admitted there is no biblical support for keeping Sunday holy, but they still support it and neglect to teach the true Bible Sabbath. How should we respond? We ought to obey God rather than men. While we cannot judge the hearts of church leaders, we must put God first and follow the light that He has revealed to us. When we know the truth, we are responsible to obey it. To Him who knows to do good and does not do it, to Him it is sin. In fact, the Catholic Church gives this startling challenge to Protestant churches for which they have no biblical answer. 
You will tell me that Saturday was the Jewish Sabbath, but that the Christian Sabbath has been changed to Sunday. Changed? But by whom? Who has authority to change an express commandment of Almighty God? When God has spoken and said, Thou shalt keep holy the seventh day, who shall dare to say, Nay, thou mayest work and do all manner of worldly business on the seventh day, but thou shalt keep holy the first day in its stead? This is a most important question, which I know not how you can answer. You are a Protestant, and you profess to go by the Bible and the Bible only. And yet in so important a matter as the observance of one day in seven as a holy day, you go against the plain letter of the Bible and put another day in the place of that day which the Bible has commanded. The command to keep holy the seventh day is one of the Ten Commandments. You believe that the other nine are still binding. Who gave you authority to tamper with the fourth? If you are consistent with your own principles, if you really follow the Bible and the Bible only, you ought to be able to produce some portion of the New Testament in which this fourth commandment is expressly altered. Friends, an attack, a breach, has been made on God's law. His holy day, the Sabbath, is being trampled on by the majority of the Christian world. The truth is not always popular, but just like in the days of Noah, and like Daniel and Babylon, and like the few disciples who followed Christ, God has his true followers who will obey the truth that he reveals to them, even if it is new or different. God is looking for people who will stand for him in these last days. The Bible describes this faithful group. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And this great promise is given specifically to those who keep the fourth commandment, the Sabbath. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of the Lord hath spoken. What a promise! I hope you will join me, friend, in honoring God's true Sabbath day and receiving the peace and special blessing that comes with it. In the final days of earth's history, when the death decree is made on God's people who refuse to accept a false day of worship, a loud voice will echo through the skies, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Yes, those who keep the true Sabbath day, the seal of God, will be protected in the last days like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Babylon's fiery furnace, God will use this great trial to test and refine their character, preparing them for heaven. And like he did for those faithful Hebrews, he'll be right by our side through the great trial and will deliver us. But those who receive this dreaded mark will suffer the indescribable pain of missing out on eternal life. Dear friend, you can avoid this infinite loss. I believe God has brought you to this video for a reason, so that you can know the truth. We are now faced with a choice. Will we obey man or will we obey God? Will you follow the crowd or will you follow the truth? The Mark of the Beast issue is all about worship and worship is directly related to obedience. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. Who will have the authority in our lives, ourselves, man, or God? Friend, Jesus is appealing to you today. If you love me, keep my commandments. Will you accept his invitation? For more information on the mark of the beast and other critical end time topics, I highly recommend this life-changing book, The Great Controversy. Now that we understand the mark of the beast, 
we will discover how this mark will be enforced in the last days and the role of the United States of America in Bible prophecy. In this video, you will learn how the United States of America is clearly described in Bible prophecy and the shocking role that this great nation will play in the final days. Stay tuned. The United States of America has been a beacon of light and hope for the world, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Could it be that the most powerful and influential nation in the world would have a critical role in end time events? Let us dive into the book of Revelation to see how the United States is vividly described in Bible prophecy. And make sure you stay to the end where you will learn the startling future of this great nation and how you can avoid deception. We will now consider the second mysterious beast of Revelation 13 the second world superpower of the last days. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Who could this mysterious power be? We know from verse 10 that this beast is seen after the first beast goes into captivity. So when did the first beast, the papacy, go into captivity and lose its worldwide prominence and power? The Bible tells us, he was given authority to continue for 42 months. We have learned that this time period would end in 1798 as the papacy received a deadly wound when the Pope was taken captive by Napoleon's general Berthier. And we can be sure from a simple study of history that the Catholic Church saw a great loss of power and influence around this time. So, which nation began to gain worldwide recognition around 1798? It is now time for the bombshell reveal of the second beast of Revelation. The United States of America clearly meets this description. It declared independence from Britain in 1776, penned the Constitution in 1787, added the Bill of Rights in 1791, and was universally recognized as a formidable world power by 1798. In fact, only the USA can accurately match this biblical description. But what does the Bible mean when it says that this nation would come up out of the earth? Interestingly, the first beast arises out of the sea. What does the sea represent in Bible prophecy? The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. According to the Bible, a sea represents a highly populated area when it is mentioned in the context of prophecy. Sure enough, the papacy, the first beast, arose in the center of Europe, a key center of world civilization at that time. In contrast, the second beast, the United States, would arise not from the sea, but out of the earth, in an area with low population, a perfect description of the USA when it first began. The Bible also describes this lamb-like beast having two horns. What does this mean? Horns also represent kingdoms or governments in Bible prophecy. The United States was a very unique nation when it first began. It had two different aspects of its government that the world had never quite seen before, civil and religious freedom. That is why the second beast is characterized as having two horns. The U.S. was known to have a government without a king and a church without a pope. This unique combination of freedoms has allowed the United States to become the most powerful and influential nation in the world. I'm proud to be an American and believe that God himself was leading in the creation of the Constitution and the beautiful freedoms that it provides. But friends, I must be honest, that is not all the Bible says about the United States of America. The following information may be startling or even shocking, but remember, if it's in the Bible, we want it. If it's not in the Bible, it's not for us. We go on to read the following about the second beast, the United States of America. He had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. What does this mean? Spoke like a dragon? How could the United States speak like a dragon? We know that a dragon represents none other than Satan himself. Satan often uses force and intimidation to gain followers, which is opposite of God, who gives us free will 
and never forces. This verse shows us that the United States will make a change from being a freedom-loving nation to a nation who uses force to impose its laws. So what will this look like? How, specifically, will the U.S. speak as a dragon? It will do this in four specific ways. Number one, the USA will use force and authority like the first beast. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast. Just like the first beast, Papal Rome, the United States will use power and authority to enforce its demands. Number two, the USA will cause the world to worship the first beast, the papacy causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Here we can see that the key issue, the final showdown on this planet, will be about worship. It will be a religious issue. Everyone will have to make a decision. Will they follow Christ or will they follow the Antichrist, which the Bible identifies as the papacy? Laws will be enacted to promote unity with the Catholic Church to form a one-world religion. True Christians will be called troublemakers and even unpatriotic for not compromising in their obedience to God. While it may seem that Bible prophecies like this are unlikely to happen, we can be 100% certain that God's Word never fails. All the Bible's past prophecies have been fulfilled with 100% accuracy, including the rise of the papacy, the change of the Sabbath, and Daniel 2, which foretold the rise and fall of four world kingdoms 2,500 years in advance. Only God knows the future, and He tells us, And now I have told you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe. Number three, the USA will make an image to the first beast, the papacy telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. How will America make this image to the beast? To understand what this image will be, we must first review the history of the first beast, the Catholic Church-State Union. During the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church joined forces with the political powers of Europe, eventually controlling them to enforce her religious laws. The United States will repeat this same practice. The fallen Protestant churches of America will use the power of the government to legislate worship. The church's unity with the government to achieve her goals will be the image of the beast. The making of laws and forcing worship is not only contrary to the government of God who gives us free will, but will be a trampling of our precious constitution which promises freedom of religion, one of the pillars of our great nation. Number four, the USA will make a death decree. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. The great power and influence of the United States will be utilized to give force to this religious law, of which we will learn about in just a moment. The church will thereby substitute the convicting power of the Holy Spirit with the power of the policeman to enforce her form of worship, and eventually the penalty for non-compliance will be death. So what will this religious law be? What will people be required to do? He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. It will be the mark of the beast that will be enforced by this church-state union in the last days. Concerning this mark, God gives us the most urgent warning in all of human history. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. As a quick review, we know that this mark is a direct counterfeit of the seal of God, which the Bible describes. Hallow my Sabbaths, and there will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. The Sabbath is the fourth of God's Ten Commandments, and it's the one commandment that identifies God as our Creator. It was instituted at creation for all mankind before the Jewish race existed. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. 
The Bible also prophesied that the Antichrist power, which we know as the Catholic Church-State Union, would attempt to change the Sabbath, and shall intend to change times and law. The Sabbath, the only one of God's laws involving time, was changed from Saturday to Sunday by the Catholic Church at the Council of Laodicea in A.D. 336. Of course, no one has the authority to change God's Ten Commandment law, which He spoke with His own lips. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. This attempted change of the Sabbath is clearly documented in history. The Catholic Church openly admits to this blasphemous act in their very own catechism. Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. What's more, the Catholic Church boasts of this change as the mark of her authority. This act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. The honoring of Sunday over the Sabbath is the mark of the beast. In doing this, men will make the decision to put the teachings of man above the teachings of God. No one has the mark of the beast right now. It will be received in the last days when Sunday observance is enforced by law. Before the death decree, economic boycotts will be used to impose this Sunday law. And then no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. But do not be deceived. The mark of the beast will not be a physical mark, such as a barcode, tattoo, or microchip. The Bible is very clear that the mark will be based on our decision. The same way that God has judged people all throughout history, their decisions. How will the mark be received? If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, Revelation is full of symbolism and we must allow the Bible to interpret itself. The forehead is where we make our moral decisions. It shall be as a sign to you on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. The mark will be received on the forehead when someone believes in a false Sabbath, Sunday, despite the biblical evidence that shows otherwise. They are deceived. The hand is a symbol of work or actions. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. The mark of the beast will be received on the hand by those who decide to follow the crowd and accept Sunday as holy in order to avoid persecution. This group is not deceived into believing the false Sabbath, but their actions will show submission to the authority of the beast. Once again, the mark of the beast will be based on our decision. Is it even possible that the United States, a country founded on the principle of separation of church and state, would enforce such a law? Friends, it has already happened in the past. Many of you may remember what are known as Sunday Blue Laws, often preventing the sale of alcohol or other items on Sundays. These are laws that are seen to have both secular and religious benefits. While many of these laws are not currently being enforced, it shows that our government has already set the precedent of creating laws to enforce religion. Not only do these blue laws protect a counterfeit day of worship, but they are a violation of the First Amendment and are contrary to God's principle of freedom of choice. And we have seen from history that when government unites with religion, it often leads to mass persecution and bloodshed. But do the papacy in the United States really have the power and influence to create this end-time superpower alliance? There is no doubt. The papacy has risen to a level of worldwide prestige and admiration. Presidents and dignitaries from across the globe flock to pay homage to the beast. The Bible prophecy of Revelation 13.3 is truly being fulfilled before our very eyes. His deadly wound was healed and all the world marveled and followed the beast. What's more, the Pope has made it clear how he feels about divisions within the church and his desire for unity. It is unacceptable to consider divisions in the church as something natural, inevitable, 
because divisions wound Christ's body and impair the witness that we are called to give to Him before the world. The problem is that the Pope is promoting a false unity, one that is not based on truth, but would require a compromise in obedience to God. As far as the United States, no one will question their status as the dominant world superpower, fully capable of enforcing martial law, especially if combined with the influence of the papacy and fallen Protestant churches who unite with them. How will this Sunday law come about, and how will it be enforced? While the Bible clearly reveals that this will happen, it does not provide us with the specific details. However, as we consider the rise in technology and the world events taking place around us, there are many possible scenarios. Perhaps a worldwide pandemic, economic crash, terrorist attack, nuclear threats, or even an overall moral decline could trigger a law in our nation that would supposedly bring us back to God. A cashless society, a microchip, or other modern technology could easily be used to identify those who do not comply with the government's decree. But once again, these items will not be the mark of the beast. Receiving the seal of God or the mark of the beast will be based on our decision to honor or reject God's true Sabbath day. How is it possible that Christians will fall for this last day deception? The Bible reveals, for false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. The devil will use great miracles to deceive even God's chosen people. Listen to how the Bible describes these miraculous signs. He performs great signs, so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. These miracles will be used as evidence to support the false revival and to pressure the world to observe a counterfeit day of worship. What other miracles will Satan use to deceive the masses? For they are the spirits of demons, performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Demonic spirits will be working at a fever pitch at this time. Satan and his fallen angels even have the ability to appear as someone they are not. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. One of the key deceptions that the devil will use in the last days is the teaching of spiritualism, which claims that the human soul continues to exist after death. Spiritualism is a lie from Satan and is not supported by Scripture. The Bible teaches that the dead are truly dead and that the righteous dead will be given eternal life when Jesus returns and resurrects them. Those who believe that the soul lives on after death are vulnerable to the deceptions of familiar spirits, which are demons posing as those who have died. Satanic beings will appear as beloved family members and respected church leaders who have died. They will claim to have messages from God, saying that God's commandment to keep the Sabbath holy is no longer binding and that we are to honor Sunday in its stead. Finally, Satan will pull out all the stops in a last-ditch effort to deceive and destroy God's people. In his crowning act of deception, a demonic imposter will even appear as Jesus himself. The Bible warns, Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, so, how can you and I avoid these great deceptions? First of all, friends, we must know our Bibles. To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. This verse reveals that we must test everything by the Bible. If it's in the Bible, we want it. If it's not in the Bible, it's not for us. God's people in the last days will know that Jesus will not touch this earth at His second coming, but He will meet us in the air. God's people in the last days will know that God's Ten Commandment law is eternal and can never be changed. Secondly, to be protected in the last days, we must be obedient to all of God's commandments, which includes the Seventh-day Sabbath. A clear description of God's last day people is given in Revelation 14, 12. 
Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Most importantly, to be protected in the last days, we must stay connected with Jesus, learning to love and trust Him more every day. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. As we pray, read our Bibles, and obey and share God's truth with others, we will strengthen our relationship with Christ, who is the only way to eternal life. While Satan and his demons are working tirelessly to deceive the masses, God and all his army of heavenly hosts are diligently laboring to save as many precious souls as possible. They are uniting with God's people, giving their words unstoppable divine power as they proclaim the first, second, and third angel's messages to a dying world. Empowered by God, the messages given by God's people will spread like wildfire across the globe and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. In the last days, every single person will know the truth so that no one will have an excuse. The truth about God's eternal Sabbath day will be revealed to the world, even to loving Christians who were not previously aware of it. In fact, this is even happening today. All of Satan's fury will be unleashed against God's commandment-keeping people. They will be seen as troublemakers and the cause of all the problems in the world. As we have learned, there will be an economic boycott followed by a death decree. But then, in the grand climax of human history, Jesus Christ will return with all the host of heaven, setting the sky ablaze with His glory. The wicked will be slain and God's people will be delivered. Friend, you can be a part of that faithful group. You can join Christ in the air and go with Him to heaven, where eternal life, joy, and bliss await you. Each of us must make a decision. Which side will you stand on, friend? There's a powerful old quote that reads, The greatest want of the world is the want of men men who will not be bought or sold, men who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole, men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. God is looking for these kind of men and women in these last days. In order to be prepared for the final conflict, we must be building our character brick by brick allowing Jesus to remove anything from our life that doesn't please Him. We are promised, but as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Dear friend, I appeal to you this very day to make a decision to follow Jesus by keeping all of His commandments with His help. And I praise the Lord for those of you who have made this choice. We are living in the final days of Earth's history, and this message must go to the world. I hope you can join us in reaching precious souls for Christ. If you would like this video to be shared with others in your area or across the world, just email us at info at finaldays.video or call 918-616 5333 to order DVDs or to boost this video on Facebook in your area. And don't forget, keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith.